If you'll take your Bibles now and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 2. I thank God that there is still power in the name of Jesus Christ. He saves, he changes, he keeps, he supplies, he teaches, he encourages, he helps. No case is too bad a case for Jesus. Amen? I've heard sometimes even Christians say, well, he's a lost cause. She's a lost cause. There's no hope for them. They're, you know, what they did, where they've been, what they've, what they've gone through, it's just, it's hopeless. No, it isn't. Not when the Lord Jesus is involved. He is able. First Peter chapter number two. We have spent months studying Joseph on Sunday mornings. We're going to spend some time looking at Jesus. The title of this series for the next uh, however many, and, and, and I wish in some ways I was like other pastors who have everything charted out for the 52 weeks or whatever. I've never been like that. Uh, sometimes I don't know what I'm preaching on Sunday, the Friday before. Everyone's different. I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. And how many weeks we'll be on this topic, I don't know. But we are going to study this and, and just enjoy this from the Word of God. Like Christ. Like Christ. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 19. Just follow along with your eyes as I read. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an, what's the next word, brothers and sisters? Example. That ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed for ye were as sheep going astray, but not, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. May I pray again, please. Father, help me today to bring forth the thoughts and the truths that are found in this passage of Scripture and other places and the things that you put upon my heart. May you use me, empty me of myself, fill me with your spirit, I pray that you'd be glorified in this message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. August the 8th, 1991. August the 8th, 1991. A commercial, a 60-second commercial aired on TV. In 1991, I would have been 15. The commercial, 60 seconds, featured various children and adults playing basketball with someone named Michael Jordan. A song was played in the background with lyrics. And the song that was played, the lyrics and the title was this, I want to be like Mike. I still remember that. I can see that commercial in my head. Isn't that funny how those things that you see sometimes get locked in there forever? I can still see this commercial. I can still, I could hum the tune in my head. 
15-year-old young man watching this commercial, a superstar. In this commercial, they, it began with, with uh, Michael Jordan in game number two of the 1991 NBA Finals against the Los Angeles Lakers, and he performs this, this very difficult layup where he takes the ball from one hand and moves it to the other hand in midair to do the layup around a defender. And the song continues, I want to be like Mike. Later on in the commercial, as the song continues on, the last part of the commercial is a clip of the shot, which is where Michael Jordan makes a buzzer beater shot to defeat the Cleveland Cavaliers and makes that shot over Craig Elo. And the song continues, I want to be like Mike. You know, that commercial changed a generation. If you're sort of my age, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody that I went to school with, every friend that I knew, every guy that I knew wanted to be like him. Oh, if we could just jump and play and, and have the money and be famous. And not only slam dunk the ball, but you've got to slam dunk the ball with your tongue sticking out. It captivated a generation. It is said that that commercial is one of the most memorable advertisements of sports marketing of all time. It's one of the most famous commercials of all time, according to articles written in 2003 and 2008. Millions of people, this article says, millions of people still have the jingle in their head. Oh, I want to be like Mike. I'm older now. I want to be like Jesus now. Things like that captivate young men's minds and attentions. You know, you sort of have to give a little bit of leeway for kids and teenagers who want to, you know, wear the jerseys and idolize certain things and put someone else's name on the back of their shirt. And, and, and I, I'm, that's not me anymore. I'll tell you what, and I know many of you are in the same place I am. I want to be like Jesus. Our scripture that we read said that Jesus left us an example. Isn't that what it said? He left us an example that ye, we, should follow his steps. The truth is, if I were to ask any group of believers, if I were to gather even this assembly together, and prior to ever disclosing what the title of this series is, if I were to ask this question, why did Jesus come to earth? Why was he born? Why did he take on a body? Why Bethlehem? Why the man Christ Jesus? Why? I know what our answer would be. It would be, our, 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 it would be the right answer, by the way. It would be a good answer. And you know what the answer would be? He came to die for me. And I say amen to that. In fact, in chapter number 2, verse 24, says that in his own body itself, he bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So I'll reinforce this answer. It's not the wrong answer. It's not the complete answer. But he did come to this earth and take on human form for this reason, to die for the sins of the world and to provide redemption, that you can be forgiven, that you could be dead to sins, alive to God. That's why he came. But that's not the only reason why he came. The Bible says it this way, that God was manifest in the flesh. You know what that word manifest means? It means he was visually put before us. God was visually put before us. And the way that God was visually put before us was in the person of Jesus Christ. 
That's why the Bible says that he has left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Can I give you some other scriptures today? He that saith he abide in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. That's what it says in 1 John chapter number 2. So in other words, if you believe in Jesus Christ, we are to walk just like he walked. Let me give you another. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Follow him. Jesus told his disciples, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, Ye ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. In Matthew chapter number 11, he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Here's the rest for the soul. You want rest for your soul? Here's the rest for your soul. Jesus said, Learn of me. Then you find rest for your soul. The book of Acts, when they found him, speaking of the early uh, uh, apostle Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. So here's our first really snapshot of the local church assembling in Antioch, which was an awesome church, by the way. If you're into studying the book of Acts and churches, the church at Antioch was an awesome church. And here's what it says about that church at Antioch. They were assembled together, which is what churches do. There was much teaching. They taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And you know why they were called Christians? Because the word Christian means Christ-like. This church in Antioch was something different. It's like a whole bunch of Jesuses. I go, oh, we, we saw Jesus, we heard Jesus, we witnessed some things, we, we know about his life, this is just a few years past. We know Jesus, and they're just like him. Would you call yourself a Christian? That word Christian means Christ-like. I think there's a couple things that stand in our way, and, and the purpose of the message this morning is to, is to get rid of a couple of things that stand in our way of being like Christ. Here's the first. If we're honest, we don't believe it's po possible. We don't believe it's possible. Hmm. We're the king of excuses. Is that right? We're the king of excuses. We love excuses. All right, so you should be like the Lord. I can't be like the Lord. I can't be like Christ. After all, I just need to dismiss this notion because Jesus is God and I'm not. So probably even at the outset of this series, some of us uh, metaphorically turned off the switch because in our mind we're saying, that's Jesus, I know me, I can't be like him. And I want to tell you, Yes, you can. Amen. Yes, we can. Because if it was an impossibility, why would these scriptures be so often in the word of God? I've left you an example that you will follow after me and walk in my steps and do as I have done. And, and all of this. And why would this be? If it's an impossibility, it was not, it is not, never has been an impossibility for a Christian to be like the Lord. I've never been able to jump from the free throw line and dunk a basketball. And most people in those days who wanted to be like Mike would never do it either. But I am telling you this. You and I can model ourselves after Jesus Christ. We've got to activate our perception that it is possible for me to be like the Lord. 85 times in the New Testament, this was surprising to me, 
85 times in the New Testament, Jesus is not referred to as the Son of God. 85 times he is referred to as the Son of Man. Think about that phrase. He is the Son of God. But why 85 times between Matthew and Revelation would Jesus be presented to us as the Son of Man? Here's, here's why I think. Because as we dismiss everything because Jesus is God, we dismiss our, our, oblig or our possibility of being like him because he is God. We forget the truth that he also was man. Why was it so important for God to take on this human form? Why was it so important for God to become flesh? Why was it so important for Jesus Christ to become like unto his brethren? And that's what the Bible says. He became like unto his brethren. And why is that so important? Because the Son of Man in his flesh left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And recorded for us in the Gospels. If it was salvation that was only important, what you'd have in your Bible is Jesus' birth and Jesus' death only. Wouldn't that be fair? If the only important thing is that he came and that he died, which is sometimes what we say. He came and he died, and yes, that is absolutely true. But all the stuff in between is the example that we should follow in his steps. John put it this way, the word was made flesh. Wow. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, he said. We saw with our own eyes. We beheld his glory in flesh. We saw his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And it was full of grace and truth. That's what he saw. The Bible also tells us this, just to dispel our, our notion of the impossibility. Well, I, I, I would be like the Lord, only the problem is he's God. Okay? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? I'm just trying to break down our arguments today. Because you say, well, how do you know we're arguing? Because I was arguing. I, I, you know, how, how can I possibly be like, I'm not talking about perfection, but I am talking about the pattern that Jesus left us is a pattern we can attain. And the reason I know that to be true is because every part, 100% of God, 100% of God, you know where he is? Right here in me. The Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit, which is not little God, which is not one-third God, which is not part God, he is completely God, lives inside of the Christian. There goes our excuses. I'm not saying that we should be prideful about it or arrogant about it. I'm not saying that we should approach it with, with a, flippant, a flippant attitude. Maybe it's good for us to realize that in our own selves we cannot, but it is God which worketh in you both to will and to good, do of his good pleasure. God's still working on me, we used to sing, to make me what I ought to be, to be like Christ. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. You know what happens when a branch is connected to the trunk or the stalk? the branch produces exactly what the trunk or the stalk is made of. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you, and ye shall bring forth much fruit. I know that every Christian is in Christ. Not every Christian abides in Christ. But if we do abide in Christ, following in Jesus' steps is absolutely possible. Let's throw away the argument of I can't. You're talking about Jesus. Yeah, we're also talking about a Christian who has the Holy Spirit inside. We can. There's one other thing that I think we have to navigate past before we ever get into the pieces and parts of being like the Lord. 
And that is we have to desire it. It's one thing to believe it's possible. It's another thing to desire it. So I'll, I'll start this second and final point this way. <clears throat> Maybe you'd argue and say, Pastor, who wouldn't want to be like the Lord? And the answer is a lot of us. Everybody hear me? A lot of us. I'll tell you why. Because we like our sin, that's why. I'm just being honest. Well, I, yeah, I, I really want to be like the Lord, but I really like my sin a lot too. Well, then the desirability of Christ is not present. Well, I, I, uh, ho, ho, Pastor, who would not want to be like the Lord? Well, lots of us wouldn't because we like us more than we like him. We're more in love with self than we are with the Savior. Pastor, who wouldn't want to be like Jesus? After all, I mean, to be like every Christian would want to be like Jesus, not when we love this world. Because to love the world is to be the enemy of God. That's what the scripture tells us. When we are in love with the things, the nature, the pieces, the parts of this world system, the desirability to be like Christ is not present. And then many times we're just in love with our own pleasure. It's, I, I hope it didn't go unnoticed that in this, in this amazing passage about being like Christ, the focus is suffering. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. The focus of being on Christ in 1 Peter 2 is suffering. Oh, we like the easy road. Question, did Jesus have an easy road? Just think about it for a minute. Jesus have an easy road? No. We like the easy road. We like our pleasure. We like our ease and comfort. It may be that we don't desire to be like the Lord. The desirability of wanting to be like Christ means that we have to come face to face again with how beautiful he is. Or maybe I should say, we need to come in, in contact again uh, with how wonderful Jesus is. I don't know, maybe I'm in a group today who doesn't really see how wonderful Jesus is, but I want to say, isn't he wonderful? Amen. Isn't Jesus our Lord wonderful? Everything about him is so uh, perfectly fair and wonderfully uh, 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 captivating. Our minds drift away to the thing. Sin captures our mind and the world captures our mind and our dreams and our pleasures capture our mind. And before long, we never take a look at Jesus. Jesus is altogether lovely. The only way that we'll desire to be like Christ if we come to the point where we once again believe that he is altogether lovely. I'll ask you this, what's not to like about Jesus? When he was on earth, he showed boundless compassion for the sick and the poor. What's not to like about Jesus? When he was on this earth, he showed tremendous compassion toward the young and the old, to the outcast and the lonely. What's not to like about Jesus? When he walked on this earth, he modeled a, a remarkable forgiveness, so much so that when he was dying on the cross and the soldiers were there who put the nails into his hands, that Jesus said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What's not to like about the Lord? So much that his humility could be seen by the apostles when he grew up in obscurity and hard work and born in a stable, raised by a carpenter. What's not to like about Jesus and his wisdom? How about this? When he was just a boy, he's at the temple and the big professors and the ones who have all the spiritual brains are asking Jesus questions. And at 12 years old, the Bible says that those doctors and lawyers were amazed at what he answered. What's not to like about Jesus? 
He was the one when he walked on the dirt of this earth. He was the one that gave hope to those that were in darkness. He was the one that restored faith to those that were faithless. He was the one who lifted up those that were down. What's not to like about Jesus? Jesus is the one whose word was always absolutely true. To this extent, the Bible says later in the New Testament that guile was, guile was not even found ever in his mouth. We love truthful people. What's not to like about Jesus? Jesus was a man who celebrated life. You'll find him attending weddings and sharing meals and visiting with friends at their home. What's not to like about the Lord? He's altogether lovely. You'll see in Jesus Christ through the New Testament that he alone had the courage to confront evil. When no one else would, he stood for right. When those that were evil were in powerful places of authority, Jesus courageously stood for right. What's not to like about the Lord? Jesus showed patience and forgiveness when his chief disciple, his number one, Peter, on the night that Jesus needed him most, three times, <clears throat> says, I don't even know that man. Jesus, so patient, so forgiving, so kind, so loving to pursue Peter after all of that failure. What's not to like about the Lord? What's not to like about Jesus? He loved his nation. He loved his nation so much that he cried over it, didn't he? Tears rolling down his cheeks as he prayed and said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Loved his country, loved his people. What's not to like about the Lord? What's not to like about Jesus? His tenderness with children. Isn't it, isn't it marvelous, Jesus' love for children? That when the disciples said, He doesn't have time, he's too busy, get out of here. Shoo, 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 shoo. Jesus said, You suffer those children to come to me. And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. What's not to like about Jesus? The one who endured such suffering. And while he's enduring the suffering, he does it with such a sense of purpose. And he was even able to find joy in suffering. Because Hebrews said when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. A man who can endure suffering and find joy in it, what's not to like about the Lord? A man who, when he walked on this earth, allowed himself to be vulnerable. Even when he went to a funeral of a friend and got chewed out by his sister. You know what I'm talking about. If you had been here, my brother had not died. And all the while, Jesus knowing that the reason he delayed was for her benefit. The reason he delayed was for her blessing. The reason he delayed was for the glory of God and allowed himself to be vulnerable to those that were close to him. What's not to like about the Lord? What's not to like about a man who prays for you? Satan desired to have Peter, and Jesus knew it. And he told him, he said, Peter, Satan, Satan is after you. But I have prayed for you that your strength fail not, that your faith fail not. What's not to like about the Lord when he prays for us? What's not to like about Jesus in his meekness and restraint when he was in in Pilate's uh, house and moved over to Herod's jurisdiction and then finally walked back to, 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 uh, to Calvary's hill and, 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 and led up, up that mountain to where that cross was dropped in the hole and there he is hanging between heaven and hell, bleeding and dying. And the song says he could have called 10,000 angels to set him free. And he didn't. What's not to like about the Lord? 
What's not to like about this Jesus who, while he walked on earth, was the perpetual encourager? In fact, when someone received their healing, this is what he often said. When someone received their healing, he would tell them this, your faith has made you whole. Well, that's a, that's a good feeling, isn't it? Your faith has made you whole. An encourager. What's not to like about Jesus Christ? What's not to love about the Lord? The one who goes the extra mile even for the doubter. I'm not going to believe unless I put the finger in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Boy, if some of us would have been put in that place and been Jesus, we'd have said, then forget him then. But no, one night they're all gathered together. And there's the disciples, and there's the doubter. And the Bible says that Jesus appeared in that room and with such grace going the extra mile for a doubter, said, Thomas, come and touch. Come on, come and touch my hands. Come and look at my side. And Thomas, don't be faithless, but believing. I'm telling you, what's not to like about Jesus? What's not to like about the Lord? What's not to like about Jesus who loves so much and his love is so big that he died for you? What's not to like about the Lord? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Amen. We're never going to be on that journey of being like the Lord until we are brought again to the place of his amazing, amazing beauty. The Bible says <clears throat> that as the deer panteth, after the water brooks. A deer, thirsty. <laughs> thirsty. We all know that feeling of thirst. I pray that we get that today about being like our Lord. I pray that we feel that same desire this morning, like a deer who is parched in the throat, pursuing after a little bit of brook of water, a little bit of coolness of a stream, that that deer might partake of that water to quench that thirst. We'll never be like the Lord until we realize it is indeed possible, until we have that tremendous burning desire to do so. I have left you an example that you should follow in my steps. A song was written back in the 1600s, called Fairest Lord Jesus. Before, I think before even our King James Bible is translated, here were some Christians. We're talking about 400, 500 years ago. Some Christians, even back then, who were able to sing, Fairest Lord Jesus. He truly is wonderful. And our best life is being like him. And in the weeks to come, let's at least this morning, can we do this this morning? Let's at least this morning come to the spot where we could say, okay, God, I know it's possible. And okay, Lord, beginning today, I'm asking the, that you would burn in my heart a desire, a, a thirst, a, 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 a savor, a drive, a pursuit to be more like my Jesus. I think that'd be a good place to start today. How about you? Can we bow our heads for prayer today?